Hello, everyone. This is Rumble. This is my birthday. I'm all alone. <laughs> there will be no party today. Um, I really haven't seen. I've been in this. What am I in this? I've been in this apartment now. This is day 44. Oh, my God. Um, anyways, I'm lucky I've been able to do this podcast and uh, speak to you every other day or every couple days or sometimes every day this week it seems to be we'll, we'll take a couple days off here or probably after this but um thank you for watching planet of the humans if you haven't please watch it on my youtube channel um thank you to all the people last night oh my god we did a live stream uh, jeff and ozzy and myself um about the movie at uh, 10 o'clock eastern last night we had 270,000 people uh, watching across all the Facebook platforms that we were on. So we were on my Facebook, but we were also on um, Now This. Thank you very much. I love Now This, by the way. If you, if, you're, if you don't get the videos and the things from Now This, sign up for that. Uh, they're incredible. And uh, Occupy Wall Street, their platform carried us, and um, uh, Democratic Socialists carried us, and uh, a few others. So thank you, uh, all of you who carried it last night. Um, I think you can go on my Facebook and other places, and YouTube certainly you can go on there and, and watch the, uh, the live stream where we take your questions uh, last night. We'll do that again next week, I think. It was, it, we had just so many people commenting and, and asking questions, so we want to we wanna revisit that after more of you have seen the film. It's free. It's on my YouTube channel. Uh, go to it, watch it. It's only 98 minutes, um, uh, but it'll rock your world. And at uh, this morning, at the 40, after really on the on the 48 hour mark of when we released it, so exactly two days of uh, the film being available. Uh, this morning we hit our um, one millionth viewer. One million of you have watched this film. Stunning. We did not expect this. YouTube did not expect this. They've been great, and they've been. They're like, whoa, the the analytics of this. I won't go into the weeds of it, but it's um, it's pretty profound. So thank you everybody for that, and please watch it. Watch it this weekend uh, with the family. I mean, kids won't understand. Young kids probably won't understand it, but tweens and teens, obviously, it's the film isn't rated. Um, but there is, you know, maybe one one cuss word there's no nudity there is there are a couple scenes where it's sad to see the way we treat the other species on this planet um other than that though it's it's totally i think watchable for tweens and uh and teens and you're the parents you can you can you know what your kids can can handle it will certainly engender uh, engender a um a lot of discussion especially with your kids uh, if you watch it, so watch it together um, um, this weekend or tonight. And thanks to Brian Williams uh, for um, having me and Jeff on last night on his show. Uh, it's the, my first appearance on any of the cable news shows during this uh, during the last uh, almost seven weeks of of this uh, pandemic. I, re I remember when I was waiting in the wings to go on his show that night. The last time I was on there. Um, which would have been yeah, probably eight, maybe eight weeks ago. I'm, 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 I've lost all track of time. Um, and he had a doctor on uh, just before me, and he said goodbye to her, and, and then they go cut to a commercial, and uh, she got up to leave, and he held out his hand to shake her hand, and she said, no, stop shaking hands. And that's a, like the first time I'd, I think I'd heard that, it certainly was for him. And I came up on the stage and he said, did you see that? I said, yes, yeah, she wouldn't shake your hand. He said, wow, that just hit me. That hit him. It hit me too. And it was kind of like, Hey, we better get, we better get serious about this. Like, I mean, we were already talking about it. We were already deep into talking about it and deep into knowing that this was coming our way, but to, but to have it be that kind of personal and thinking, she's, I mean, just shaking somebody's hand could kill me. And then I remember he, he then, before we went on live, Brian Williams told me he had 
read this book recently um, about the 1918 uh, flu epidemic called, and the book was called The Great Influenza. And he said it's a great read, so I got the book, um, and then I got the, and then I got the author of the book on my podcast. You probably remember that podcast, if you, that, that episode. Brian Williams is a good guy. Um, you know, no, nobody, no two people agree on everything the same way, but um, um, he's fair. He lets you speak. He asks good questions, and um, and he has a sense of humor. So. Um, Thank you, uh, Brian, for um, having me on, having me back on for the um, first time now in some time. Um, I haven't really wanted to go on TV, frankly, uh, but I, I was on Stephen Colbert the night before and really enjoyed talking to him from his home to my home. And um, I had just listened to a song just before we went live and uh, by this uh, folk singer, that you probably know her. Uh, she's really one of my favorite singer songwriters of all time. Her name is Mary Chapin Carpenter. I was listening to the song of hers, and I and I just I thought at the end of the uh, interview, maybe I'll, I'll sing it for for Stephen. I, I have never sang on his show, of course, and uh, it's not something I knew he would be expecting. And I honestly thought they'd cut it out of the show. Also, I was so nervous doing it. There's, I don't have any accompaniment here with a guitar or piano or band or anything, so I just had to do this. Uh, I'm not a professional singer. I'm just a normal person um, who I think I can sort of sing decently. And um, so I did it. Now, um, he tweeted it out afterwards. He tweeted, I mean, they tweeted out clips of the show, but he tweeted out just this, me singing the song and encouraged people to listen to it for just for some, maybe some little inspiration. So anyways, I did, I did, I clicked on his tweet and I, I watched myself sing the song and it's like, okay, I might, I might score that a 40, maybe 45, but that's, that's uh, not good enough. So I felt, I felt bad for that. I didn't do the best job I could have. So I thought um, on my birthday um, podcast, I will, um, I will attempt it one more time, and then I, I will spare everyone after this. But I wanted, I want you to hear this and 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 to do her justice. And then Mary Chapin Carpenter, I, I, she tweeted out the, the. So I I guess she was okay with it because and she she tweeted me uh, singing it, but I wasn't okay with it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try it again. The, the song is called "Why Shouldn't We," and it and through the various verses it asks these questions and and starts out with the premise that um that we believe in things that we don't see or we haven't seen i've never seen afghanistan i've never been there i know it's there i know we're still in our longest war so so all the way from that to whether you have some spiritual belief or whatever uh, we believe in things we cannot see, she sings. We we believe in things that we're told cannot be. We believe in things that um that we used to that we used to see. I'm I'm already butchering uh, the song. It's a beautiful song. You know what I'll I'm gonna put the song up on um on my podcast uh, platform on the uh, notes here so you can click on it and watch her sing it. Uh, that I, that's what we should do. We should not even have me sing it. Just go to her, go to Mary Chapin Carpenter and, um, all right, all right, all right. All right. Yes. I will give it one more, one more shot. This is the last chorus of, of the song. Come on, darling, let your spirits rise. Come on, children, open up your eyes. God is everywhere. Buddha's at the gate. Allah hears our prayers. It's not too late. Why shouldn't we? All right. Thank you, everybody, for indulging me. But 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 please listen to the original. Uh, I have a link for it uh, there, right here on my page. Have you ever done that thing where you where you look up uh, to see who was also born on the day that you were born, or other great historic events that might have happened on the exact day you were born? 
not just any year, but the year you were born. So the, the, the one historic event that happened on the day I was born was that Hank Aaron, the great baseball player, um, who went on to become the all-time uh, leading home run hitter in the history of baseball, and in, in my mind still is. We don't count the ones with the asterisks because of the drugs they used. Um, Mark McGuire and Barry Bonds, Sammy Sosa. Sorry, guys. Uh, Hank, Hank Aaron is still the home run champion of all time. He hit his very first home run of his major league career as a rookie the hour after I was born, or maybe it was the hour I was born. It was, um, um, he played for the uh, Milwaukee, um, I think they were called the Milwaukee Braves. And this is before they went to Atlanta. Um, that's it. That's the big historic event. The hour I was born, Hank Aaron hit his first home run. No connection. Um, just just a fact of, of history. And have you, have you ever looked up to see the people that were born on the day you were born? Not just the actual day you were born, but, you know, on, on this day, April 23rd. Um, so I, so I, I Googled it today. <laughs> I just typed in who was born on this day. First name that comes up. Like, I'm really expecting something, you know, great and big. First name, Timothy McVeigh, American terrorist, it says here on Google. American terrorist Timothy McVeigh, the guy who blew up the Oklahoma City Federal Building, was born on this day in 1968. So I'm like, really? I'm sharing my birthday with McVeigh. Well, that's interesting. Um, also born on this day, the singer Roy Orbison, a uh, wonderful singer from really a, a little bit before before I was born. Um, but he came out of the sort of 50s and 60s um, Elvis era, but had a completely unique sound. Um, also born on this date was Shirley Temple, Lee Majors, the $6 million man, Valerie Bertinelli, James Buchanan. Uh, he was the 15th president of the United States. He's the guy just before Lincoln who totally just wouldn't deal with the, the, the rising problem as we were starting to head towards civil war. Uh, he did nothing uh, really to stop it and is considered one of the worst presidents of all time. But uh, John Oliver was born on this day. That's really cool. I did not know that we shared a birthday. Uh, the documentary filmmaker Chris Hedges, born on this day in Detroit, Michigan. And William Shakespeare, this is William Shakespeare's birthday. Wow. 1564. Okay, that's good. That, that's better than McVeigh. That's better than sharing it with McVeigh. Anyways, do that sometime. It's kind of <laughs> to see who you share your birthday with. But, uh, you know, we're in this pandemic, and I'm not the only one having a birthday during uh, our stay-at-home orders and so none of us are able to, to celebrate our birthdays with our friends and family. Uh, I have a suggestion that, that any of us who are having a birthday um, since whenever you've been holed up, the beginning of March till now, if this goes on into May and June, when I say if, of course, I'm, I think we know it's going to go on. Um, but, but when it's over, and it will be over, um, those of us who missed our birthdays, there should be either some kind of big joint national party for us or or we somehow, whether we do it in our neighborhoods or towns or whatever, <laughs> we're the pandemic birthday babies and um, we didn't get to have our birthdays. So, so we have to have our birthdays when this is over. Okay, everybody agree to that? Good. All right, we'll figure out, we'll come up with some, some good, uh, cool idea. In the meantime, I also suggest that you do not add on the year uh, that you are that you've changed into or gone into uh, here during the pandemic because you didn't get to have your birthday. I say you stay at the age that you were at pre-pandemic, and you do not add on that year until we're out of this. Now, for some of you hoping to drink because <laughs> you're 20 years old or whatever, for you know, for younger people. It's if you need to add that year, you want to look like you're more mature and older, whatever, you you should do that. Everybody else, though, you know, if you're if you were 36, you're still 36. If you were 57, 
you're still 57. Let us hang on to just any anything we can at this point, right? So anyways, I want to get to my, my special uh, birthday surprise here for you. Um, and this, um, this happened just, um, well, you know what? I'm not going to, I shouldn't give it any introduction. I got a phone call and, um, uh, and I had already, I was already, I'd already hit record here and somebody had told me that I was going to get this call, but I didn't know if it would really come in. And then it did. And I'd like to play that phone call, um, with my special birthday surprise guest uh, for you right now. This, by the way, is his first appearance on this podcast, um, as incredible as that may seem. Um, not the first time he's been mentioned, as you will know. Um, but um, but I was very happy to get this call. Uh, let's just let's roll that um, right now. Um, and thanks again, everybody, for being here virtually with me on my birthday. Um, hang on now. I have uh, just received a call from Senator Bernie Sanders, and uh, we'll put him on the line here. And uh, uh, Bernie, are you there? Uh, th- thank you for calling. Welcome to Rumble. Michael? Bernie. How are you? Oh, good, good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for uh, phoning in here. I'm just uh, hitting record as we, um, as we speak. Um, this is my podcast. It's called Rumble. And by the way, Michael, Michael, let me thank you very much uh, for your help in the campaign. You were great. I know you spent a lot of time and energy on it, and I really do appreciate it. Well, that's very kind of you, but um, it's my responsibility as a citizen um, to get out there and and campaign for the person I uh, thought and, of course, still think uh, would take us where we need to go uh, to improve not just this country, but the planet. So thank you for doing that for so many years. You and I have known each other a long time. I first came to Vermont to campaign for you back in, I think, 89 or 90, the first time that you You remember that? I do remember that. You, remember remember you came that. to Burlington? In Burlington. I came to Burlington. You asked me to come, and it was, um, I don't know if it was a union hall or some kind of community hall. And um, uh, I like to tell the story. I say that there's there were you you'd gotten three people to come on the stage <laughs> and endorse you at that point because you hadn't you hadn't been elected yet to congress and you basically you had two guys from Vermont who make ice cream and one guy from Michigan who ate ice cream and uh <laughs> <laughs> and that was but it was it was it was a great day and ever since that day and you won you won that election 1990 um i have uh been uh, such a huge fan and supporter and but i think more importantly feeling like uh feeling less alone um and and the movement that you've helped to build over these 30 years um and always making about making it about us as your slogan said this year not me us um and this movement built built itself into millions and millions of americans um who are behind all the things that, that you've stood for. Well, you and don't, we don't minimize. You. Uh, I know. Well, thank you, Michael. And don't minimize. You know, you've heard me say this when you have been in my presence and when you, you don't know, I say this when you're not there. It, it's like you have cracked through a corporate media. Uh, you have done as one person raised more issues than the entire goddamn corporate media with their trillions of dollars. Have to get the, you have the guts to ask the hard questions. And you've done brilliant work, and that's enormously important. So now that we've finished, yes. congr- as old men, it, I know. It means, congratulating but, each other. Yes. Work <laughs> it means a lot, though, hearing that from you. So thank you. But yes, moving on to the bigger issues of the day. Um, the Well, let's get one thing out of the way first, because I know a lot of people that listen to my podcast um, uh, were you know, frankly devastated that um, we didn't succeed here. It looked mm-hmm. it looked mm-hmm. really good, um, yep. and in and, and it happened so fast. I mean, you yep. won. You I think you were the first candidate ever who, in the first three uh, contested primaries and caucuses, where you won the popular vote. Nobody had done that before, and you had a string yep. of three in a row, a landslide in Nevada, 
And I think that all of us were like, here we go. Even even the mainstream media was acknowledging and calling you yep. the the, uh, the the uh, presumptive nominee or the, at least the presumptive, well, not the presumptive, you were the front runner. And in a matter literally of stunningly in three days, South Carolina yep. on Saturday and Super Tuesday, then three days later on Tuesday, um, it, it, um, it went to a place with that, created an enormous amount of, of despair amongst all of us. Yep. And I'm certainly, I'm sure with you, but, but uh, of course you're such a fighter. You, you never looked like you ever were in any despair, but um, what do you, what do we say? What do you say to those, well, to those people? Because a lot of them are rightfully upset, um, disappointed for sure. Um, and, and many of them angry and, um, not knowing really what to do at this point. Well, thank you for the question. And I'll give you my judgment. Others may disagree with me. Look, we knew from day one, when I sat down talking to my family, talking to my closest advisors, uh, should we go forward? Should we go Should we win this campaign? You, you know, Michael, you've been through this many times. Running a campaign ain't easy. Takes a lot out of the candidate, family, friends, et cetera, et cetera. Do we do it? And what we all concluded is that when you take on the entire corporate elite, you know, Wall Street and the drug companies, the insurance companies, military industrial complex, when you take on the political establishment, and that means not only Donald Trump and the Republican Party, but the Democratic establishment as well. You know what? That's tough stuff. You take on the corporate media, throw that in. That is very, very hard stuff to accomplish. We knew that. We knew what we were getting into. So what happened? is we worked our asses off man, uh, in Iowa. And you were there with us. Yeah. Remember your trips to Iowa? Uh, yes, I remember doing six campaign rallies in one day. One day. And, and that's right. And we that's what we did. You did it. Every day was doing it, yes. It, and I did it. We went to small towns, 100 people or 500 people, or, you know, to Des Moines, 1,000, whatever it may be. And we worked really, really hard, and we ended up winning the popular vote. Uh, in, uh, in Iowa, uh, although because they have a complicated process, the mental gets, I don't know, we may have lost by a half a delegate or something like that, but we won the popular vote by 1,000 votes. Good news. Then we went to New Hampshire, but here is the good news is we won New Hampshire, but the, by, uh, I think a point and a half. Bad news is that we only got 24, 25% of the vote. Not a lot of votes. The truth given the fact that I live in Vermont, neighbors, New Hampshire. Right, right. Then, then we went to Nevada, where we had a great campaign. And we did really well with young people, with our friends from the Latino community, working class people. We won, a, as you indicated, a landslide victory. Now, what happened after that, at least my perception is, that uh, these were very important victories. And the establishment and the media wakes up and they say, oh, my God. Bernie Sanders could be the Democratic nominee. How horrible is that? And what they were writing. Read the Washington Post, you know. Article after article, New York Times. Anybody but Bernie. You can't allow this to happen. And the problem was, and here is the truth of it, and, and this is where it becomes kind of strange, is that when you're running against six or seven people and you get, <clears throat> you know, 30, 35% of the vote, or in the Hampshire, you get 24, 25% of the vote. That's not a big vote, but it wins when you're running against seven other people. So it didn't take the establishment too much time to figure out that if we can get rid of some of those people and force Bernie to run against, you know, maybe one other candidate, his life would be a lot more difficult. So here is the two sides of the story. I think if our campaign was a normal establishment campaign, they would, you know, the other candidates would have likely stayed in the race longer, okay? And we would have continued to do well, especially on Super Tuesday. But what happened is we saw Amy Klobuchar drop out, Pete Buttigieg dropped out, and we had hoped to win seven or eight states on Super Tuesday. We in California really big. We in Texas big. Well, we ended up winning four states. California, we won, not by as much as we wanted. In Texas, we lost. So 
when, you know, people had fewer options, the more conservative voters, you know, voted for uh, Joe Biden. Uh, so that's the reality. The reality is if I was a conventional can- candidate, we were a conventional campaign, the establishment would not have worried. Uh, but on the other side of the coin, and the other candidates may not have dropped out, on the other side of the coin, what has to be said is that, you know, we were not winning 45 or 50 percent of the vote. That's just a fact. Uh, we were winning 30, 35 percent in some case is a uh, few of those. So when it came to a two-person race as the race proceeded, uh, you know, the conservative folks, more conservative Democrats voted for Joe. Older people voted for him overwhelmingly. We won the young people with big numbers, but we were not able to bring out as many of them as I had hoped to. Now, that's the simple reality right. uh, of the dynamics of that campaign, as I see it. The But all the, all the polling, and I believe these polls, because they've been consistent through the years, the last few years leading up to this election, the majority of Americans, and even the exit polls, in the in primary states that you lost, the exit polls, when they asked them the questions, uh, do you want Medicare for all? Or even in the southern states, they asked the question this way, would you prefer to keep your own private health insurance or have health insurance run by the government? And even with the question posed that way, the majority of the people in Alabama yep. and Mississippi and places like that sided with your position and not just that position, raising the minimum wage. I mean, Absolutely. just go down the whole list. The, okay, here's the story. What happened there? You know, yeah. All right, I'll tell you what happened. I mean, two things. Uh, it is what we should not minimize, Michael, and what is enormous, and I want all of our supporters to understand that. We have won the ideological battle. Yes. The American people agree with virtually our entire agenda yes. that the political system That's is correct. corrupt, that massive income and wealth inequality is disgraceful, that health care is a human right, that we've got to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, we've got to deal with climate change, we've got to make public colleges and universities tuition free, immigration reform, criminal justice reform, women's rights, we gun rights. We have one, you know, the, the, yes. The public is behind all of that. They want, and they want the rich to be taxed properly. Exactly. But what the system and the establishment were able to say is that, you know, uh, Bernie can't beat Trump, uh, which is also, I believe, untrue. Uh, they they went to people's, they went to people's fears about this. Yeah. So if you're an average voter, you think, you know, I like Bernie. I like his ideas, but it's so important that we beat Trump. I just can't vote for him. Mm. I think that was thrown at our face. A lot of stuff was thrown at us. And the truth is, you know, I believe from day one, and I believe today, that we would be, do I think Biden can beat Trump? Absolutely. And I'm going to do my best to see that he does. I think we will probably be a stronger campaign uh, than than he would have been. But be that as it may, we've got to go forward uh, and do what we have to do, and that is to defeat Trump. But your point, two points here, and I hope everybody understands this. Our campaign, when I say our, I'm talking about the millions of people who have been involved in that campaign, talking about you, Michael, and all the great surrogates that we had out there. We have won the ideological battle in redefining what this country should stand for, and that's no small thing. And no, second and, of all... Yes, and the majority of Americans agree. That's why we've won it. We've won that's right. on and the second ideas. second of all, yes. Michael... Equally important, or more important, the young people, and by young I mean not just 20-year-olds, people 50 or under strongly support us. So, you know, we did not do well, to be frank with you, and it bothers me and it disturbs me. We did not do well with older people. But the future of this country is with the younger generation, and they are behind our views. They are fighting for our views every day. So those are enormous victories that we have won that I think uh, speak well to the future. And we should should all feel very, very good about that. We should. We should. It's still difficult, though. I mean, this really, to some of us, almost feels biblical in the sense that um, we got to the promised land. The American people agree with us now on all these issues. But Moses did not, was not allowed to cross the River Jordan. (laughs) Into the into the well, pro- I mean, I'm sorry. I don't mean to turn you into any kind of um, um, now, Moses. I'm not, but here's the point. Profit right? that has been. You made. know, you know this, and I know this. Yes. 
the struggle continues. What do you think would have happened if we, let's just say, that other candidates stayed in? Let's just say we did well on Super Tuesday. Let's just say we had the momentum. Let's just say that we had a majority of votes on the first ballot who won the nominations. Let's say we beat Trump. What do you think happens the first day that we are in office? Do you think that there will be not massive, massive, massive opposition from the ruling class of this country massive. trying to sabotage everything that we do? So the struggle, it's not just winning the presidency. It's needless to say something you and I worked very hard on it. A few million other people did. But we understand, you know, what the corporate media does not. We're taking on an entire political and economic power structure that is designed to preserve the massive income and wealth inequality that exists in this country today. So the struggle continues at every front, and we just got to, you know, keep going forward. So in going forward, what are our next steps? What, what, what does this movement, the movement's not going away. So right. what does this movement do? Um, and and you've, you've stated the, the obvious thing in terms of removing Trump. But um, but it's more than that because we had these problems right. before we had Donald J. Trump. So right, absolutely, wh- absolutely. Let me get back to a, a, a brilliant film uh, that you did because and I hope what was it called? Capitalism with Love. Was Capitalism, a love story. Yes. Capitalism, a love story. And I hope everybody sees the film. And I'm not just buttering up my book. No, no, no. Thank you for saying that. Here. You know, Bernie. Actually, that's when people who haven't seen my films, they say, what, what one film should I watch that really kind of conveys what you're tr- trying to say? I say watch Capitalism, A Love Story, because it has pretty much all the b- the basic beliefs that I have are in that film. So, But anyways, you were going to reference it in some, no, I mean, some uh, manner. Yeah, so, so go get it. It's online. Go get the film. Yes. Rent it. Watch it. But here is the point and, and the great struggle that we face, Michael. And, you know, it's been very exciting you know, for me to be in that struggle and so, uh, how so appreciative for that. You know, what inspires me is, and, you know, you're part of that, going out and seeing all of these great people. Yes, you and I, well, you're in New Hampshire, you all are wonderful people that want to transform this country. And that has always inspired me. That's my heroine, if you like. That's my, that's what keeps me going. And uh, I, I think the challenge that we face is not just taking up the incredible power of Wall Street and the big money interests and their significant power over the political and economic processes in this country. That's big. That's huge. But you know what else we have got to fight on? And we have such have had success is to make people imagine and understand that we can live in a different world. And I've said over and over again, that if people believe that they are not entitled to health care as a human right, or if you think that all your worth is $10 an hour, that's what you can continue to get. And the struggle, I believe, and I know you've been waging it through film and in your world, and I've been waging it, waging it in my world, is to say to ordinary people, you know what? You are human beings. You are entitled to health care as a human being. You are entitled earn a decent wage. You and your kids are entitled to the best education in the world. If you're old, you don't have to live alone on on inadequate social security benefits. You're entitled to live out your remaining years with dignity. That is the struggle to make people understand and what we are entitled to as as human beings, what our human rights are, and the system every, every day, Michael, in a hundred different ways, tries to make us not feel that. Right. You follow what I'm saying on that? Absolutely. This, I think that is what you just said is so critical um, because people listening to this, I hear, I hear their despair, Bernie, and I hear um, their fears. And, um, and compounding this is the fact that we're living in the middle of this pandemic, which has got everyone rattled, everyone afraid. I mean, there are people listening to this who are, who feel that they may have, you know, not knowing what will happen, they could have seen their grandparents uh, back at Christmas for the last time. Not, and their grandparents were healthy at Christmas. Um, that, so we're, everyone is just on pins and needles. And on top of this, 
the fact that Trump could get another four years. That's right. It's, um, I think the, the really, I agree so much with what you just said, because if we don't have that sense of ourselves, sure. that if we're willing to just be in this place of, yes, I'm just, I am just worth $10 an hour or, you know, well, that's the school, that's the neighborhood we live in. So that's the school I'm stuck sure. with. Sure. Anytime, boy, the, when we talk or think or feel like that, it is music to the ears of those in power. Absolutely. And when they that hear, that is how they, yes. that's right. And, and when they hear that us, is music to their ears, music, music to their ears. That's right. They, they have beaten us down. It's not just their power. It's not just, you know, we ran into this in the campaign, all of the super PAC money and all that. That's real. That's powerful. But what is more powerful is just what you said. They have beat us down. They have beat us down. And if we think so little of ourselves that we're not entitled to health care or decent education or decent housing or decent wages, or that, you know, our community should be run down and full of air and water pollution. If that's what we believe we are entitled to, you know what? That is exactly what they will give us. That's right. And what you have done, what you have done in your films, is you've taken us outside of this country. And I love the film. I mean, not only uh, Capitalism, a love story, but also Sicko. That was another brilliant movie. And what that showed us, uh, I'll never forget, what country was it? Where you went in there trying to pay the bill and they didn't know what in, the in a London about. in a London hospital, um, I tried to pay a bill, a medical bill, and I couldn't. No one, they had no apparatus to accept money from a citizen, even a non-citizen like me. And then I, I saw the cashier window. It said cashier, and I went aha, and I went up there. I knew <laughs> there was some money involved in this. <laughs> and the guy says to me, "No, I'm the cashier that gives. I give the patients money to go home." <laughs> they, they hand you they hand you cash as you leave a British hospital for your transportation and other needs you may have getting home to recover. And you did that, Michael. What country you were in? An Asian country, I believe. We are trying to ask them how many people go met bankrupt because of medical bills. The guy looked totally bewildered. No, I know he was like, word. well, none. What country was that? You remember that? That um, that was in. Oh, geez, that's God. You're asking my own movie. Um, you know, I think I think that was in Canada actually, because I said yes, that's right. Nope, you were in Asia. I, I was in Asia. Okay. You were in Asia. Taiwan. Oh, it doesn't matter, but but it, maybe it was Taiwan. I yes, think it was. Yeah. yes, because and I kept going down the list. How many people have lost their homes in the last year uh, due to medical bills? Zero. <laughs> How many people bankrupt? They didn't Zero. even know. No, they didn't even know what the hell you were. Yeah, yeah about. I know the first. I know. I know. They're looking at me like, "What strange talk are you talking?" I go up and down the street asking people, uh, "Please tell me what a copay is." Uh, can you define what a dedu- <laughs> what, a, what is a deductible in all the? I did this in all the countries I went to. What is a deductible? And I'd say it in their language so they'd understand. And they they looked at me like I was a crazy man on the street exactly. with a microphone. Well, you know what? You were a crazy man. It's those are crazy concepts. Because it's crazy. It's right. And they're, they're right not to understand what the hell you're talking to. You're talking about. So that is the point. What we have got to. You're asking me what. You know, and we've got to do it in a thousand different ways. But bottom line, yeah, we've got to take on the powerful ruling class. But we also, and all of us have to deal with it, every single one of us, uh, have to understand what as human beings we are entitled to. And it is, you know, that gets back to another thing you did. I learned a lot from you, Michael, and you're hearing it today. Yeah, you, you were one of the first, I think, <laughs> you were one of the first to put on YouTube uh, FDR's 1944 speech, right? That's yes. His 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 last uh, what would be his last State of the Union State of the Union speech, right? And, and he had to do and, it from and, the White House because he was sick. And what Roosevelt said, and and again, thank you, Michael, for doing this. Keep getting that word out. Roosevelt and this became an important part of our campaign. What he said is, you know what? Political rights are very important. You know, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. You know, all of that. Great. We need that. We must have that. Right. But you know what? Economic rights are human rights as well. Are you really free if you're making 10 bucks an hour today and living under enormous stress and you can't afford health care? Is that what freedom is about? Well, you don't think so, and I don't think so. Most Americans don't. So the struggle now is to incorporate the concept of economic rights, decent paying jobs, and the right to a decent job, the right to health care, the right to education the right to decent housing, the right to 
a, a secure retirement. These are not radical ideas. And that is got to be the foundation of the new America that we fight for. Yes. This, uh, what, what Roosevelt called a second bill of rights. Yeah, and, exactly. Um, and the right to all those things, the right to a day off. There was no such concept then. The idea of the weekend that you that mm-hmm. you, you should only have to work mm-hmm. forty hours a week, or that maybe a twelve year old shouldn't be in a factory. Um, all these things that and, and Roosevelt did get a lot of this passed, and he was called a traitor to his class. He was called a socialist and a communist and this and that and whatever. But um, the people support it, just like the people now support these programs and policies right. of yours. That's right. And, right. and that's why I'm, I have not given up hope, Bernie. I hope I don't sound like I have, because I, I believe that once you lit the flame, once this thing, once the wildfire of these ideas took hold with the American people, that can't be put out. That, I agree. You, you can't put that back. You can't undo what has now been done. People's eyes have been opened. They've experienced it. And I'll tell you, right now, during this pandemic, if there's anything you hear everybody saying is we need health care for everybody. We, our health care system is broken. You know, you were right. It is a broken, broken system. And, and we weren't even talking about during the campaign of just maybe the doctors and nurses should have access to face masks and gloves. <laughs> you know, we were t- talking about the larger, but just it's so broken down to that level that we have nurses dying. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, how- and, yeah, How but, unbelievable, Michael. I mean, you know, you're in the middle of this. Take a step back. Yeah. This is the richest country in the history of the world, and we have doctors and nurses dying because they don't have a bloody mask that costs 50 cents yeah. of their face. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. You were on Stephen Colbert a week or so ago, and you, the two of you were talking about this and about health care and the time we're in, and it was amazing to hear him say that um, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but essentially that everybody's eyes are wide open now to what you were talking about with healthcare and how in a time like this, we can't have anybody thinking they can't go to the hospital or if they go to see a doctor or, you know, that, that they could go bankrupt, that they could lose their home or whatever, that this should never be a concern. This is a human right. And it was so profound to hear, you know, cause he's, I mean, Steven's a great guy, but he's not, He's not involved in any political movement or party or anything like that. And and the way that he agreed with you and even broadened it, I thought, um, was very powerful. And it's what I've been seeing and hearing, even though we're all in, encased in, in our homes, um, we are talking to each other more now. People have rediscovered the idea of a phone call. <laughs> and, um, hmm. and this is what everyone's saying, Bernie. I mean, when I say everyone, I mean the vast, vast, vast majority of people now realize when, on the other end of this pandemic, this has to change. We are not going back to the old normal. We are not going to go back to Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Look, how insane is how insane is it that millions of people who are losing their jobs today, that is a terrible tragedy, but they're losing their health care as well. And it's a lesson to be learned today. I think the overwhelming majority of the American people now know it. Care is not an employee benefit. It is a human right. End of discussion. Yes, and and I can't imagine anybody saying to you. First question, I believe, if I remember, on one of those, one of the, either the debate or the um, on a town hall, um, and it wasn't just from Anderson Cooper. You were constantly being asked. Well, Senator Sanders, this sounds like a nice idea, but who's going to pay for it? How are we going to afford it? And it's like, now, here's what, here's what everyone is saying. How can we not afford it? And we've all seen now that the government can pay for a lot of things immediately. Right. And, and um, it may mean that we have to spend less on aircraft carriers and things like that to fight the real enemies that we're all facing. And, and this is a form of terrorism right now when we don't have a healthcare system to heal us during a time when tens of thousands of people um, are getting this virus and, and many, many, many of them dying. So it, 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 it it's just so stunning how quickly the, the, the public was already with us on the overall issue. But now, Bernie, I truly believe that we're going to have more people who were not involved 
not actively involved in pushing for this and fighting and demanding that their senators and Congress people um, get behind this. That's, I think, what's what's going to happen when we come out um, on the well, other. Well, Michael, I, I I think you and I know. Uh, you know, we want people to learn the lesson, but not in the horrible way that we're forced to learn it right now. But the lesson is being learned. Yes, I, and the I, lesson. I, is, I believe that. Yeah. You know. It, it, um, it, 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 Bernie, you know, let me, it, it, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry. No, no. I just, I, I, um, I was just going to encourage everyone who's listening to this um, that uh, I will post on on my site here ways for you to get involved. Um, so you, you don't just have to listen to this podcast. You can, when this is over, sign up, join up, right. get, get involved. There's even things you can be doing right now um, while you're home. In fact, it's a great time while we have you know time off. In that sense, those who are home, there's a lot of people, as we know, are not home because they're risking their lives. Hey, listen, anyways, I know we got to go here, Bernie. So thank you very much for participating in this podcast. Keep up the good work and we're all with you and we're all behind you. Okay. Thank you very much. Talk okay. To you take bye care. Bye. Uh, bye-bye. Well, that's it. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in to my uh, birthday rumble podcast thank you bernie sanders for calling me and uh lots of work to do lots of realistic hope ahead of us here in terms of um what we're going to do and who we're going to be on the other end of this pandemic don't forget to watch planet of the humans uh that's for free on my youtube channel you go there um filmed by my friend jeff gibbs um i was the executive producer of it It's a very powerful film about what we're facing in terms of turning things around with the environment and um, where we need to be going and what we've been doing wrong. Um, You know, it's it's important, and I would hope, especially people on the left, are open to self-examination and and admitting sometimes that you know maybe maybe this wasn't really the right way, or it was the right way for a while until it wasn't. we're in such a, a state here with this planet. I remember Jimmy Carter putting solar panels on the roof of the White House. Do you remember anybody old enough to remember that? 1979, the President of the United States was trying to get this turned around. And, and to do his part, he put solar panels on the, on the roof of the White House. Ronald Reagan came in the next year and tore them all off the roof. And that was the end of that. Just imagine had we started, though, in 1979 with Jimmy Carter saying, we've got to do something about this and we got to do it right now. We have lost 40 years. Once Reagan took over and started the ruination of this country, and yes, it started with him. No hero, no saint there, folks. He destroyed unions. He destroyed the middle class. He began the destruction of the middle class. Income inequality. You can trace it all back to Ronald Reagan. Um, So, Planet of the Humans. It's too late now, by the way. Just a spoiler alert. We cannot solar panel or windmill our our way out of this. I was going to call it a pandemic. It is a pandemic. It is the environmental pandemic. And the pandemic we're in the middle of is tied to how we humans have treated this earth. This virus came from a species that's not ours. And what we've done to those species and how we've treated them and how we've encroached on their land and their habitat Did we think that this wasn't going to come back to hurt us in any way, the way that we've treated this planet? I think this is the first of probably many things, unless we get busy, all of us right now. Please watch this movie. Please do something. Um, It'd be the best birthday gift for me if you would do that. Nothing would make me happier to hear that you're all doing something, or at least thinking about what you're going to be doing post-pandemic. Thank you for celebrating my birthday with me here all alone in my apartment (laughs) on this podcast. No, I really, 
we're all going through this together. And for those of you who are not in your apartment or your home because you're out there helping to keep us alive, <clears throat> everybody from the healthcare profession to the people stocking the shelves of the grocery stores, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. I hope we can repay this to you in some way. Very grateful. Okay, folks, we'll talk soon. Be well. <laughs>